I think the way that colour is used in Don't Look Now is very unusual because it picks out a particular colour, red, against a kind of desaturated background. And uh, while films of the time were experimenting with colour, because the Eastman colour stocks made it possible for far more films to be made in colour by that time, um, whether a d director would choose to have colour as a very obtrusive facet of a film um, wasn't always the case. Even a, a filmmaker as experienced as Ingmar Bergman was reluctant to use colour. His, his oeuvre up to that time was all black and white. Filmmakers were often very cautious about using colour because colour was not something seen to distract audiences away from the plot and so you had to do it very carefully. It's a whole other uh, level of filmmaking that you have to learn to control and to use and to be aware of. And it's exciting, but it's more difficult. There wasn't a great deal you could do in those days when it was a photochemical process. I mean, you, you know, you, not like you can do today, you can put windows on, you can do this, you can do that. I mean, we could, we could make it, in those days, you could make it a little lighter, a little darker, um, but a bit of, you know, make it cooler, cool, warmer, a bit of, a bit of cyan, a bit of magenta out, things like that colour is kind of intrinsic to Don't Look Now. I think it was at the time, and I think it's true now looking back on the film 45, 46 years later. Um, I think the image of the film, the kind of the red figure running through Venice, um, even though it's only used very sparingly, has become such a key element of what we imagine the film to look like. So many parts of our lives, red is such an important visceral colour. We know if we see a red sign, we've got to stop. You know, if you see blood coming from a wound, that you need to sort that out. Like, it's a very, very powerful colour. Uh, it's exciting, isn't it? What does it mean to us? What does red mean? I mean, it's, it's excitement and also vulnerability. I think it, it combines the two things. Most people have a sort of a sense of what colours might mean symbolically. Uh, red for danger, um, blue for coolness, uh, green for envy, for example. Um, I think we have all of those understandings, but we have to remember that the means, meanings of colour can change and they can shift. And certainly filmmakers can often play with a colour within a film using it to mean something in one context, but then in another context it can become different. Christine's red mac in the beginning of the film. You could see this as, you know, a child who's got a fashionable item on. She's adventurous. She's having a great time. You know, she's full of life. But of course, subsequently in the film, the colour red becomes associated with a whole lot of other things, uh, far blacker, as it were, um, than, than its original presentation. That red coat symbolises something which is um, not just... Um, uh, startling and colourful but also it symbolises the fragility of blood of, of how we are made up of something which is which is very easy to break and what I find is fascinating about it is the kind of red mac that it is <laughs> it's a shiny red mac because it kind of the shininess the wet look you could say perhaps anticipates the film's preoccupation with surfaces and water and slipperiness Nothing is what it seems. The opening sequence sets up a lot of the, the ideas that the film will, will take some time to work through. It sets up the idea of second sight, it sets up the kind of associations of red, it sets up the contrast with Venice nicely. You start out in this very kind of English countryside setting, um, you know, it's green grass, blue skies, children playing in the garden. There's a very kind of normal feel to it, but then again, the use of red and the use of blue start to undermine that through the brief glimpse of what seems to be a red hooded figure in the slide from the church um, and in the moment where the water gets knocked over and that you know now so famous idea of the water kind of spilling across the slide and obscuring all images of the church. Other interesting details I've noticed is that the brother Johnny has cut his finger and so as he's watching his father trying to revive Christine he has blood on his finger and it's a kind of interesting again why why we have that he's cut his he's cut his hand on a shard of glass and then later we see Johnny when he's had his his own accident at school and Laura's gone out to find out what's happened to him 
he's covered in a red blanket. Um, so again, we have this play with colour and, and it might not necessarily mean anything, um, but it's just enough to create this intriguing set of connections and uncanny similarities and resemblances that may give the film its kind of haunting quality. And I think it's a chromatic haunting quality that really echoes throughout the film. In the film Red Appears Elsewhere, I think it's, it's rather fascinating that Laura actually wears red quite a bit in the film herself. She's got a red bangle on when we see her with the sisters in the restaurant. She wears red boots and she has a shiny red handbag when they go out for dinner after the love scene. For me, one of the key issues with Don't Look Now is actually how it uses colour in Venice. Um, because we always talk about the opening sequence, we talk about the use of red, but actually Venice becomes the character in the film in terms of how it's depicted. It's not your kind of sunshiny tourist Venice, it's a slightly more muted, drained of colour. You know, most of Venice is seen in kind of greys and browns and kind of shadows. So it's setting this up as a slightly unsettling place. The Venice of that film is sort of mouldy and green and damp and, and uh, not bright and not perky, but kind of uh, deathly. There's a famous thing that Rogue says about um, looking at a painting and seeing a spot of red in the painting and that being the thing that makes the painting come alive. And I think you can see that about with Don't Look Now. When the film shifts to Venice, its kind of colour composition changes, but it's very much still that strong use of red in those, in those key moments. Luckily, I got a lot of credit for that, but really it's the truth of it is it, that came in them um, in costume design, which we worked very closely with, and with the set decoration. I mean, so we took, there was nothing red in those sets, except, and there was red every now and again when the, we put it in, like, um, you know, uh, when he and the bishop, after he's fallen, had the accident, they're walking, they see the body coming out of the wall. We, we just track along those kids with the red helmets. There's something very foreboding there, you know. And so that that was very important. I mean, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be so hard to do that now with the, you know, digital and color correction. You could just take the red out very simply, but it was a little difficult in those days. It had to be very precise. There's a little bit of red in Donald's scarf. Um, there's a there's a scene where he's looking into a canal and looks up, and there's a pair of men's red underwear up there. You know, uh, you know the full whatever they call those suits. You know, and things like that. So it was judiciously put there. The sequence where they leave the hotel obviously is one of those moments where we see Venice in a very particularly shadowy light. Um, you know, it's all about kind of getting lost and kind of passing over bridges and not being entirely sure where you go. So it sets up the idea of both Venice and the film being a bit of a labyrinth, being a bit kind of uncertain where you're going. But obviously in that colour acts both as kind of a, a lure to John, because it's one of those moments where we get a brief glimpse of, a, of the red figure. Um, and because John and Laura get separated, when he looks for Laura, the thing he can spot more than anything else is really her red bag, because again, it's that spot of colour in the film and in the image that we are drawn to. And I think what's interesting is, again, because of the slightly dilapidated view of Venice we get, that's set up against actually quite a commercial view when they finally stumble back to the main street. And actually, there is more light, there is more life there. And that's partly because we get colourful posters, we get light coming in from shops and restaurants. They're able to actually um, come back to some degree of colour. I also think the colour blue is a little bit overlooked in the film, or in discussions of the film. Um, obviously, um, the blue and the red often come into contact with each other during the film. So in the opening sequence, um, when we see the red um, sort of smudge slide all the way across the slide that John is looking at, it's almost almost, almost always presaged by some blue. Um, and when it starts to kind of fill the slide completely, it kind of, you get a kind of moment where it feels like it's going to blow out the slide and blue becomes a very dominant theme and then the red takes over. And I think that link across the film um, is very clear. Um, 
later, there's a sequence where John goes to the police station and the police inspector is framed um, in front of a map of Venice in which the dominant colour is obviously blue, but the swirl of blue on the, on the map looks very similar to the swirl of red and blue we see in that opening slide. And one of the key ones, I suppose, is that if you look at the Baxter family across the entire film, in the, at some point they're all wearing blue apart from Christine who wears red. Um, and in fact, as John walks through Venice for most of the film, he's in this very big blue coat. You could associate, if, if you, again you were being symbolic, blue with coolness, with rationality. And we must remember that John is, is constantly fighting the idea that he can be, he is psychic and that he's, he's had this experience and he constantly wants to push it away. Throughout the film, I think there are pla he has placed colours to intrigue us. The colour of the brooch, the idea of that being symbolic. I think it's a version of a sea goddess that again suggests there's a turquoise theme there which is about the blind woman and about those sisters that somehow they're in touch with the, the depths of with water. There's a scene after um, Laura's supposed to have left for England and um, John is on a uh, Vaporetto going back um, to the hotel or to the church, I'm not sure. Um, and he's in his big blue coat um, and he's kind of in and he sees the funeral cortege kind of go past. Um, and there's a moment there again where um, there's an uncertainty around vision, but that's a sequence where also colour is quite important because obviously we see Laura dressed in black and we see the two um, women who, one of whom is supposedly psychic and they're dressed in slightly more colourful clothes. There's something about that sequence which seems to suggest that he can't bridge the gap. Laura! I think that idea of nothing is what it seems, which I think is a line Donald Sutherland actually says in the film, um, is obviously about the, the puzzle the film sets up for us, is what can we trust and what can't we trust. Um, one of the key themes there is you can't trust colour. You can't trust um, red, particularly, because the belief that it might be Christine, who is there in Venice and is trying to get a message to them. The film doesn't confirm whether or not there is a message coming from beyond the grave, but obviously the message of follow the red figure is clearly the wrong one um, because of what happens to John. Um, so I think there's a way in which colour red there becomes more, becomes less trustworthy. You don't want to necessarily put too much faith in that. Um, Laura puts her faith not so much in the idea that there is a red clad figure in Venice who they can go and find, but that there's, there's kind of a, um, a message from beyond the grave. Um, whereas John seems to focus very much more on the physical, on the actual notion that there is a figure in Venice. Va bene. Tutti va bene. Io amico. I'm coming. You get a lot more kind of sandy, kind of um, stone colours in the church sequences, which kind of sets it up as something slightly different. I think one of the main uses of colour in those sequences is it gets back to kind of a thematic idea of rogues, which is the idea of film as a mosaic, as a montage. And obviously one of the things that John is most obsessed with in the film is trying to match um, the colours of a mosaic in the recreation of the church. Um, and because of his obsession with colour um, in that moment, trying to make the colour work, trying to get back to something authentic, something original, obviously speaks to both his and Laura's desire to get back to some degree of normality, but also very a kind of nostalgic version of that. How do we put our lives back to what it was? It is one of the one of the few films where you feel that you're watching something which is where you're being, as I said before, in the hands of a mature filmmaker who is not just showing you images for the sake of showing you images. The casualness of the scenes is sometimes as crucial to the culmination of why it's there and the there is no casual use of colour in the film 
it's as if the film has many layers and that many of these layers involve colour that you may think you understand it at one point but then you're, you're wrong footed and you have to rethink it again when it's presented in a new guise. So, so it's a wonderful play with surface texture, layering and depth that the film presents and colour is fundamentally important to this.